hello and welcome to Rusty Junk. No, we're not starting, as you can see, we're not starting Season 7 yet. That will be in a couple of weeks' time, where Season 7 will be officially launched, which is great. So we're going to do one more this week in the 80s. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Amanda can't join us as she's on a walking tour in the Jewelry Quarter in Birmingham um, that she got a present for. I think it, she got given it in 2020 and it just got pushed down the road. It's obviously nobody could do anything in 2020. So, yes, yeah, she's gone and done that. So that's where she is. She does send her apologies. But, hey, we've got us three. So we'll be fine. We'll be great. Um, how is everyone? All right? Good? Doing good. Yeah. What did we think yeah. of this week to to pick from? I was I was like, well, not really a great deal going on but this week, but you probably might find a lot of things that I didn't. So um, who wants to kick off? Should we, Joe, do you want to kick, kick off proceedings? Yeah, I'll kick it this off. This week in the 80s. Go for it. So one of my favorite movies, which it was not a great movie, but I love the actress that was in it, was Flashdance, came out April 15th, 1983. And I guess they're celebrating the 40th anniversary of the film. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's been uh, all over TV over here. Like they've been writing, you know, doing articles, mini documentaries. And uh, I fell in love with Jennifer Beals in that movie. Yeah. And... You know, I was a little disappointed to find out that she had a like a stunt double, dance double. Yes. But I met her. I met her in real life. Uh, her name was Maureen Jahan. Okay. And uh, I met her at a racquetball court and uh, I talked to her for a little bit. Um, but she did, you know, all the dance work, which was pretty amazing. And they kind of hid her for a while. And then eventually they let it be known that it was her. And right. even more disappointing is that last scene where she auditions for the ballet school or the, the school of arts or whatever yeah. um she dances but so does marine jahan and then there's a guy that dances in a wig um because he does like this spin move that they used to do with break dancing like where you spin on your back okay and so marine jahan couldn't do it so this guy did it who was one of the break dancers in the movie in the beginning and he had a mustache. Like if you zoom in and everything, I mean, you could see this guy's got a mustache. And, <laughs> right, okay. and he's in the leotard, and he's got her wig on and all that. Um, but yeah, no, I just fell in love with that girl. Yeah, and uh, she really didn't do too much after that. She did uh, the bride with Sting. Um, with Jennifer Beals. Yeah. Yeah. Did she start something with Nicolas Cage? She may have, but I don't even recall. I know she. I think she did the devil in the blue dress with Denzel Washington. Um, she was on uh was it the book of Boba Fett? Uh <laughs> it might have been. I could kind of put that to the back of my back of my mind, never to be yeah. accessed. She was like the head of the bar, or you know, she ran the bar in that town or whatever. And right. then she got killed at the end. And it's like, well, thanks for nothing. Um <laughs> great promise though. I'd have to say she's good in the film, but I watched the film just before Christmas because I went, do you know what? I've seen Flash Dance since the 80s. So I stuck it on. Boy, it's awful. It's very bad. It's not you a good what? film I, at I, all. I feel I need to interject here. A, to let our listeners know that I'm actually on the pod, so good to be back, everybody. But <laughs> why I'm probably not on the pod as often as others. Uh, I'm just going to declare up from rather than try and pretend otherwise. I have not seen this movie. And so, Joe, yeah. I'm looking to you to persuade me as a red-blooded man in my now 40s. What, what What's the appeal of this of this movie? Just take a step back. <laughs> I get the attractive actress. Don't get me wrong. I get that. But There's nothing well, else. Was, he hasn't got anything else. I'm afraid to even <laughs> say, you know, because this is PG rated, but it, it got me through a lot, I'll just say when I was growing up. You know? <laughs> okay. uh, anyone that's seen that movie will know what I'm talking about. Um, yeah, they're, they're, you know, I, I would check it out, Dom. Again, it's not going to win any Academy Awards. Uh, the soundtrack is pretty good, like even just like uh, the score. But there's a couple of songs like Maniac and What a Feeling came out of that movie. Um, and the dancing is really good. But yeah, it's like... Oh, Michael, <sighs> Michael Nuri. It's the guy in it, I think. Was that his yeah. name? Yeah, and oh, I don't God, remember what dreadful. the hell he did. It's so, yeah. The plot is, is oh, pretty you, much non-existent. 
but yeah, and at times really... can be offensive. I, I was sat there watching it. And man goes, "Is this flash dance? Is this?" I'm like, "Yeah." So why does everyone think this is good? And I'm like, "I've you, no idea." You just watch it for the dancing. So basically, it's almost like these girls are in a strip club, but they don't strip, but they dance with like the least amount of clothes possible, right. and like they pour water all over themselves. Like, I did you ever see Coyote Ugly? Oh yes, Dom. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's like way better than that, you know. It's I I would just see it for the dancing and for Jennifer Beals, but the love story is boring as hell. Yeah, originally I was reading, I think they were going to get Kevin Costner to play uh, the Michael Norrie role. Not even if he had to work with that script, not even he could with with his genius. Not even he could have rescued it. No way. And. Uh, I, Mickey Rourke too, you know. It's like, how did they settle with this guy? Yeah, Mickey Mickey Rourke would have been all right. He's great in nine and a half weeks. Yeah, Which no, the, both seven. of them would would have been really, really good. But she, but she stole the, the movie. Um, that's again, it's too bad she didn't get it, her better career out of it. Did you ever see that movie, The Bride with Sting? No. Um, no, you should check that. it out. I, well, it, it's split into two stories, which is kind of weird. Because uh, it's supposed to be a remake of The Bride of Frankenstein and Jennifer Beals plays The Bride of Frankenstein. Sting is Dr. Frankenstein. And then he, you know, he has a Frankenstein monster that doesn't look like Herman Munster or anything like that. I mean, he looks, you know, like a big dude, you know, and he's not too bright. So she screams when she sees him and he runs away and uh, he starts his own life. So there's two stories interwoven into this. And along the way, he meets a little person, you know, and they they go into the circus and they have like this friendship, like where he's a little guy. So he protects him from the bullies. And oh, it's you mean really like, sw- like uh, are we allowed to, I don't know, are we allowed to use the term? When what? little person, do you mean like Willow? Yeah. Like Willow, yeah. Oh, okay. I know, because I, I think, you, yeah, you're not supposed to no. use the M word, you know. But, oh, I was going to uh, use the D word. Oh, you can use the D word. I think you use the D word. I don't think you can use the D word. You definitely can't oh, yeah. use the M word. We need a, a woke dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> Things we can't say. It's all anyway, right. it's half, half pint. I think that's acceptable, isn't it? Uh, I don't. Yeah. God, no, that isn't. I don't think that's acceptable. He's a little dude that comes up to your knees. Um, yeah, okay. But it's a really sweet story. If you just watch it for that, like the, the stuff, like a sting falls in love with Jennifer Beals is, you know, bride character and all that um it, it it's it's good you, i would say just watch it for the interaction between Fra- uh frankenstein's monster and and his friend uh it's really really well done i'll, I'll see if i could find just some clips and i'll send it to you guys because it's really you know it, it melted my heart we'll say the stuff where i thought i was gonna really like the jennifer beale stuff yeah, yeah. anyway Anyone that hasn't seen it, you need to see Flash yeah, Dance. You, you, need to you can watch, turn the volume off. You know? Right, you need to <laughs> yeah, you need to do the fast forward. Two 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 talking points from that that I think Joe we should, um is do movies like that exist anymore where it's just about sort of t- t- titillation, really, I suppose. Um, because in the era of kind of constant all access internet websites, shall we say, <laughs> and uh, you know, do, do the youth of today kind of still pick their way through a, through a movie like that. And, uh, you know, I totally relate to it in the 1980s. I was the same as a teenager, but these days I'm not sure that there's a market for, for that anymore. If you need your needs catered, there's other places to go. And, and, I, and I guess the second one is Sting being in a movie. Is that just the ultimate red flag? <laughs> do, 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 do not watch this film. Do, you know, what, what's, should I think of any notable exceptions? Well, actually, one of my series... Seven season seven um, nominations has got has got sting in it, so I'll avoid that one. But maybe lock, stock, and two smoking barrels. Perhaps I was going to say, yeah, there's there's the exception. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, he was. In, I remember he was in Quadrophenia. He was in June. He was in Dune. Um, yeah, no, he's nothing special, but it's just like I think everybody like bent over and kissed his ass just because he was Sting. Uh, he he didn't deserve an acting career. I, I love him in the Police and oh yeah, his solo career, but. Doesn't deserve an acting career. Yeah, God. doesn't I, deserve. I'm with, I'm with Joe. I'm with Joe. Yeah, but he's he's pretty good in Lockstock. But yeah, all right, okay. 
Uh, thanks for kicking that one off, Joe. Um, uh, I'll go next. Um, I was looking at the birthdays. Um, so we've got John Cryer, Molly Ringwald, and Matthew Broderick all in the same week. Um, and another one. Hmm? Another one too. Another one. What from the John Hughes? No, Bruce Willis. Oh right, okay. Well, no, I was going to talk more about the. I don't think he was in any of the teen films. No, uh, but no. But he's an eighties icon. He is absolutely. But so is well to to my mind. So is Matthew Broderick. You know, he's uh... no, he is. I would say he is too. Do you want to do you want to take a guess on how old Matthew Broderick is? Or will be this year. Sixty. Dom. Um, I'm going to say a bit older, perhaps in sixty-two, sixty-three, kind of mid. Wow. Mid-60s. You mentioned every number but the one, sixty-one. No. no. <laughs> I was like sixty-one. Can't be sixty-one. But then you look at it, and Molly Ringwald's fifty-five, and John Cryer's fifty-seven. John Cryer, Ducky from Pretty in Pink, fifty-seven. Um, and you look at Matthew. When I was looking at that, I was like. Matthew Broderick's career. Can we just have a chat about that for a minute? Because Ferris Bueller, Biloxi Blues, you know, that era, great. Those one of his films came out this year in 1987 called Project X, which is about chim- mm. um, chimpanzees and, and it's got space. Helen Hunt in it and it's space. <laughs> and that just sounds good. Helen Hunt, chimpanzees, space. Um, normally, in fact, that did draw me in because I was kind of like, oh, it's got Ferris Bueller in it. I definitely want to see it. From what I can remember, and I haven't seen it for quite a while, it is awful. But Matthew Broderick's career. Yeah. All I can think of is he popped up again in Godzilla. Yeah, I think uh, that ruined his career. I think it must have done. It was it, That was a dreadful film. A truly a dreadful film. Um, and then I saw him in The Producers. Yeah. And he was very good in that, very very good in that. But then, what else has he been doing? It must his, just his be theatre. Credi- his, his last credible role was the Cable Guy. Surely that was like the, that was probably his. Mm. his, his oh, movie ever. yeah, Mr. Cable Guy. All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but, yeah. But that, that was before Godzilla. So I think you could be right. Maybe Godzilla just destroyed his career, and then I think when he made the decision to um, play Inspector Gadget, that was probably when he acknowledged oh, his career was. Oh, uh, yeah, Jeez. Was yeah. Yeah, you I mean, failed. If that's if that's if that's what your uh, where you want your career to go, I mean, it's bad enough Doctor Robotnik being Jim Carrey in Sonic the Hedgehog, but he's he's all right in that. Sonic the Hedgehog's not bad. They're not bad films. I, I think he had you know a weird personal life. Well, he was going out with Jennifer Grey, who played his sister in Ferris Bueller. Yes, and didn't they get weird. into a a car accident in England or Ireland? Yes. And uh, they they killed somebody because yeah. they were driving on the wrong side of the road. So that didn't really, you know, that cold story kind of hurt. I, I would say him in ways. You First, think that, you, that had a. Do you think that had an effect? I, I think it did a little bit over here, you know, because you know we were like, oh, again, I, I was she driving? I forget. I, I think it might have been her. She was driving, and, yeah, and. Uh, it was like they killed somebody, you know. It's like wow, and then it was just weird that he was going out with the girl that played his sister. I mean, I think <laughs> people had more of a problem with that. Um, yeah, it is. A, and it, it is a bit odd. Two two people apparently uh, killed. Um, yeah, so pretty pretty significant event. Wow. And I guess like you know, a lot of people might have looked at it as like, well, two rich kids going and you know traveling across. The, you know, not across the country. Uh, uh, oh, I, you know, they were in England, and you know, if they were more grounded, maybe they wouldn't have, and you know, they wouldn't have caused the accident and all that. I don't know. It, 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 I felt kind of weird about it when I heard it. Mm. Not like I was like, oh, we'll never watch another Matthew Broderick movie again. Period. End of sentence. Oh, people will do that now. I mean, these. Oh things, yeah. yeah, yeah, they will. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, so uh, I basically I think that's what I wanted to kick off with. I'm I'm staggered that my childhood uh, 80s uh, actors and actresses. Uh, oh no, they're all actors now. Sorry, not actresses. Um, are that old? Just makes me feel old. 
Well, John Cryer, he was in Two and a Half Men, right? But he he had a decent career because he had Charlie Sheen and then um, Ashton Kutcher was it that ended up killing the series. Yeah, yeah, that guy that guy's kryptonite for sure. Yes, <laughs> yes, he is. So yeah, there we go. Well, Molly, Molly Ringwald, you know, if we talk about kind of career-ending decisions, didn't she burn her bridges with John Hughes? She kind of got the two. They both did. So yeah. yeah. So Anthony Michael Hall, John Hughes wanted to basically mold him and be like protege and carry on and because of the way i mean it's yeah because of the way that they were they just refused i said oh no we want to go off and do other things i mean you look at what Anthony michael hall did at the end of the eight end of the 80s he suddenly popped up again in edward scissorhands as the as the jock as the guy in the you know the varsity you know baseball jacket or, or whatever um and then you're like wait a minute you you seem to have grown up a little bit, you know. You seem to have been, you know, you've been working out, a bit like Superman, been been working out. Um, but yeah, um, I th- he 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 was offered stuff and he turned it down because he thought he was bigger than that. Um, and I listened to a podcast uh, that he did um, uh, when Halloween kills Halloween kills came out, and he's very apologetic about it all. He's very you know, he wished he could make amends. He wished he could do anything. And obviously, sadly, John Hughes passed away. Well, it's too late now, you know? it's So, so she she turned down some kind of wonderful. I think that was the, um, the yeah. struggle that the camel's back for their relationship. And, uh, mm. yeah, the sort of role she would kill for today, no doubt. Um, yeah, absolutely. So- I mean, what's she done? I mean, I remember watching 2004, I was watching Not Another Teen Movie, so the spoof on the John Hughes thing. And she turns up as the uh, as the um a woman at the check-in desk at the airport. You're like, okay, well, I understand you're gonna pack all these cameos in with people from John Hughes films. I get that. But what else has she done? Well, he was in uh, Riverdale. Do you do you watch ever watch that show? No. It's based on Archie comics. No. Is she he, play Archie's good? uh the first scene's pretty good. And they have a lot of hot girls in that show. Okay. Um, but it's kind of like a, a nine nine oh two one oh. In fact, Luke Perry played Archie's father. Oh, and then no. I think at the very end of the season, Molly Ringwald comes and she plays his mother. And she did not age well, you know. Oh, we'll okay. Say that. I mean, it, it was fairly recent. I would say if it I think they're up to their sixth season or seventh season, Riverdale. So it must have been like seven years ago. Okay. But you're not watching it for the acting, though. Did I watch her for the acting? No, well, you're not watching up. Riverdale for the acting. It seems. No, 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 no. no like I mean, flash well, dance. again, y- yeah, kind of, yeah. yeah. Okay. Did like, did you guys have well read Archie comics over there or when you were kids? No, no. no. It was just like a bunch of kids that were in high school and they were very nerdy and you know, but anyway, they made a series out of it, but they tried to like twist it around and make it like a, a murder mystery series, and uh, you know, all the characters are having sex. And anyway, it's 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 interesting, but you know, check. Uh, I'll okay. send you stuff. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> put it, put but, it this way about Molly Ringwald. So, if you look at her most recent career, uh, <laughs> then four of the last three of the last four films have been The Kissing Booth and its sequel and its follow up to the sequel, which I've never heard of. Several of the films don't have links on her uh, Wikipedia page, so they're so obscure they don't have a Wikipedia page. <laughs> but really, you have to go back to, um, yeah, as you say, not another teen movie is the last one that I recognise, but it's yeah. really Pretty in Pink was her last hit. Um, so she really, you know, she had a run of absolute, you know, standout, memorable, yeah. films. Three, three, Bang. yeah, yeah. Breakfast yeah. Club, 16 Candles, yeah, Pretty in Pink. Yeah. Wow. And then disappears. Well, and uh, Anthony Michael Hall, and then he turned down a uh, full metal jacket. Yes. Yes, which we discussed. Yeah. Insane. Well, you know, hindsight's a wonderful thing. So what have you got, Dom? Where, so I know, I know you pitched this as being snippets in vinaigrettes. Is that, is that the term that you use? Vignettes. Vinaigrettes. <laughs> Vinaigrette. That's salad dressing. Yeah. Well, this is a, I, I think this is a salad of a, of a podcast. We bring in all sorts of different bits and pieces <laughs> to make it a delicious meal, which we serve to our listeners. But 
Um, I, I want to take a step back from that and focus on the, the big picture. And my uh, my insight into this week in the 1980s is just the absolute quality of, of 1980s music. Um, so, you know, whenever you grow up is is the era for movies or for, for, for music, which most resonates. And we can sit here and split hairs about the 80s and the 90s and the noughties, whatever. But if you look at what was number one on this day in America, um, in, in this particular Week so in reverse order. So nineteen eighty nine, she drives me crazy. Find young cannibals. Eighty eight, get out of my dreams. Get into my car. Billy Ocean. Eighty seven, nothing's gonna stop us now. Starship. Eighty six, rock me Amadeus by Falco. Eighty five, we are the world. USA for Africa. Eighty four, Footloose. Kenny Loggins. Eighty three, Billy Jean. Michael J- Jackson. Yeah. Eighty two, bit of an exception perhaps, but Kiss on my list. Hall of Notes. But nineteen eighty, another brick in the wall. Pink Pink Floyd. Now, not all of those songs will be on heavy rotation on my Spotify um, playlist, but you know, with the possible exception of 1981, they are all iconic, memorable, stone cold bangers um, there. And and it's not as if that's just a, a you know a free uh, snapshot there where um, where you know it reverts to, to the mean afterwards because the I then scrolled ahead and the songs that replaced those. So 1980, uh, another brick in the wall got replaced by Call Me Blondie. Oh, yes. Billy, Billy Jean got replaced by Come and Eileen, the um, school disco uh, <laughs> classic <laughs> dance uh, dance filler um, there. 1986, Kiss uh, by Prince replaced uh, Rock Round Bears. Like a Prayer, Madonna replaced um, the Finding Cannibals track. It's just it's just hit after hit after hit. And the competition um, and the quality there, I think, is is extraordinary. And also kind of makes me really nostalgic for when the charts actually mattered and you know what oh, was the yes. yes. top ten actually had some some meaning, was somehow kind of quantifiable as well. Um and I and I miss that, you know, to be honest. And I look back on that era and and each of those kind of in its own right is a is a brilliant song, but also kind of tracks how the, the decade progressed as well. And I think also, given this is an Anglo American production that we we all feature on here as well, shows the strength of Kind of some of the British contribution as well to that uh, to that era and uh, you know the, the British chart success that was had in America as well. So so I'm flying the flag for 90, 1980s music. And I think that week, uh, yeah, brilliant. I think that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the charts. Love. Uh, I, I, I was surprised the Joe, to see Fine Young Cannibals make that list. Now you know she drives me crazy. Is like a great song. I, I like the Fine Young Cannibals. I do. Listen to them, but it was that way a bit of a one hit wonder over there? Would most people in the street from from our age kind of know that that band or not? Well, that song was huge. They they played it so many times, um, and that was a good song too. I, I did. I don't know. Did, was it a one hit wonder? Did they have other songs that? Oh yeah, good thing. Over here they were popular and yeah, very popular. several top ten hits. Um, but that was probably their biggest. I would say, yeah. But yeah, I, that was pretty. I, I still remember that video. You know, it, it played so many times. Because because yeah. they were they were a Birmingham band, weren't they, Charlie? They're, they're, yes. Um, your, your neck of the woods, yeah. Yeah, yeah like yeah, music yeah. Like, like that kind of like defined the '80s in ways. Uh, although it seemed like it could have been an '80s song, could have been a '90s song because it was. You said it was '89, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, it was like almost going into a new decade at that point. But no, all those songs that you mentioned, you know, definitely bring back memories. And, you know, it's funny how you said, you know, Kiss on my list, uh, you know, wasn't a great song for you guys. But they, it was pretty big over here. Call Notes were, were really big. Oh, I love Call of Notes. Yeah, I guess probably the more, you know, if there was a, I think Charlie's mentioned this show before. The pointless answer on that that list there is uh, would probably be the kiss on my list. But yeah, not to say it's a bad song, just perhaps less kind of um, era defining than some of the other ones. But yeah, yeah. you know, Billy Jean, Billy Jean, Footloose. Um, it, I've got a particular soft spot for Rock Me Amadeus as well. I remember my yeah. brother was a couple of years younger than me. He started to get into music at that time. That was his favourite song. Um, you know, that that was Wall to Wall Airplay in the UK when that when that came out. Was that Falco? Falco wasn't, Falco wasn't that a one hit right. wonder? Yeah. Because he had uh, two other hits. He had Genie and, oh, four of the hits. Three of the hits. Genie, Vienna Calling. Uh, oh, t- 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 try to test myself. <laughs> yeah, and another one. But yeah, he wasn't a one hit wonder. My friend <laughs> used to annoy the hell out of me with that. I, I love that song, but he used to like 
just go like walking down the street and going, so, 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 pasta, so, so, pasta. <laughs> I think that's why my brother liked him so much. But uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Epic songs for an epic era. Absolutely. Um, and I've got a story about uh, Come On Eileen by Dexys Midnight Runners. Um, I almost got, ch- we, two of us almost got chucked out of a party. And by party, think of a, l- a village. Well, the village in question was Trevonan, which is where my parents live in Shropshire. And Trevonan Village Hall. I mean, imagine, you know, to our transatlantic listeners and anyone that's not from the UK, very quaint, very English, very, you know, and we were having an 18th birthday party. Uh, sorry, 21st birthday party for two of the lads that lived in the village. And my mate thought it was funny to interpret Dex's Midnight Runners Come On Eileen as a faith healer healing somebody so that they could walk. Right. So when you get the, so he sat in the chair, he dragged the chair into the middle of the dance floor. Now, there's aunties, there's uncles, there's old people. A lot of old people around, right? <laughs> and a lot of, you know, 21-year-olds were all like the same age. So he put the chair into the middle of the dance floor and he asked me to to pick some water and start bless and start blessing him and throwing water over him. And when it gets to the come on, I need to do right, eh? right? He started to like go, Oh, I can feel it sounds horrible now. I can feel my legs, you know, and it was just so we did that, and I kind of like drew him up, and went hallelujah like this at the end, and he starts dancing and, and, and dancing in joy. We had words; <laughs> we were drawn off to the side and go. I don't know what you th- I don't know if you think that's funny. I I don't think many people appreciated that, and I was kind of like, and every time I listen to that song, I think of Alex on the floor learn, learning hallelujah. It's a miracle. That's oh, his that's... midnight runners as performance performance art, yeah. That's yeah. Um, <laughs> it, 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 more creative interpretation than because it's a, it's a staple over here, Joe, for school discos, for um, one one in the morning floor fillers, or for yeah, you know, weddings. Get everyone on the dance floor. The, the DJ's got to throw a hail mary to get everyone out there, and, and that's the sort of one. Because even those who aren't gifted with dance moves <laughs> stomp along to uh, to that. Yes. So, um, hats off to Alex for taking it to the next level. I think. Yes, to interpretive expressionist, interpretive dance. It's like, well, okay. Yeah, let's well, do that I, again. I'm, I'm embarrassed for both you and Alex's younger self. That was uh, very cringy. It was his <laughs> idea. No, no, no. Wait a minute. We performed it very well. I mean, I'm looked, sure you did. It looked great. But, <laughs> but now, I have that picture in my mind. So I have a feel next time I hear that song, I'll think of that during that slow think part. Of that. And also think of like really old people with like, Pearl necklaces, um, spitting out the tea. <laughs> just, just think of it that way. Yeah, the, the things you could get away with in the pre-smartphone era when nobody had a portable video camera with them at all times. Yeah, because uh, I'd love to see that going viral. Weirdly, I, I weirdly we given the video camera back that day, so we'd hired a video camera for the weekend. Uh, sorry for the for a few days, and I've got a great record of me having a party at my house and dad coming home unexpectedly because I'm filming everyone that's coming up the drive and I didn't realise dad was back. And there was uh, 40, 48 people in, in the house. Uh, yeah, that's a story for another day, but how I got away with that. But I've got it all on record. I've got it all on video, um, which I may share with you, but not with not with you, dear watchers, stroke listeners. Nobody needs to see what I look like at uh, well, that time, yeah, at 21. Nobody needs to see that. Anyway, Joe, back to you in this roulette and little medley of... Uh... Yeah, um, April 16th, 1981 was the final episode of Buck Rogers in the 25th century. And I was a big fan of the movie because the movie came out, tried to compete with Star Wars. And I remember seeing that movie with my dad and actually enjoyed it. It was, you know, again, like a modern day astronaut was frozen in time and he ends up going into the future uh, in the 21st, 25th century. And uh, everybody wants to learn about the past. And he's he was a great uh, soldier slash astronaut. And uh, he helped the Earth fight against whatever invasion they were having. It was it was a good movie. Um, And then it ended up becoming a tv series 
for three seasons. And I watched a, a couple of the seasons or a couple of the episodes anyway, but it, it started to age after a while and people got yeah. tired of it and they eventually, you know, got rid of it. But I had met uh, Jill Gerard who played Buck Rogers at uh, one of the comic cons over here. And it's funny. Cause like when you go to a comic con, you see people and you're just shocked that they're there, you know, like, like I saw Peter May who, who played Chewbacca and he was just sitting there. And nobody was by him. And I just walked over to him and, you know, I said, you know, you're Peter Mayhew. And he's like, yes, you know, and, and he was such a nice guy, you know, and we just talked for a few minutes. And so I'm like walking down this row and I see they're selling the Buck Rogers comic book and, and Jill Gerard is sitting there. It says his name. And again, he's older now. Yeah. So I didn't fully recognize him, but then I looked at him and said, oh yeah, it's him. And I says, are, are, are you Jill Gerard? And he's like, yeah. And he was just like reading a, like a paperback novel. Um, and nobody was, was no by cue. him. There was no cue. No. Oh. And uh, he was like in like a small little square, you know, box, like where like a bunch of boxes like that, that they were selling comic books. And he was in one and he was selling comic books, you know. And uh, I says, oh, I just want to tell you, I says, I saw the movie when it came out. I loved it. And I watched the TV series. And I just want to thank you for, you know, being a part of my my youth and so many people, you know, in this country. You know, we were huge fans and, you yeah. know, it must be amazing. And he's like, well, thanks. Anyway, he goes, I'm selling this comic book here, you know, for thirty five dollars. I'll autograph it, you know. And, uh, and he goes, do you want one? And I'm like, uh, uh and I said, no, <laughs> you know, it's like After uh, all that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're amazing. God, I really like that. Do you want the comic? No, 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 <laughs> no I'm, I'm good. <laughs> no, I'm all right. <laughs> and he's oh, like, all right. And he went back to reading his paperback novel. I felt so bad after. Oh, you should feel bad. You you, you, yeah. started, you made him smile. You made him all nostalgic. He's finally got somebody. Well, I was I was low on cash at the time, you know. Um, but yeah, now I, I'll always that'll always haunt me. I felt so bad, because especially just seeing him, you know, in that life where he has to go to these conventions to make money that way. You know, it just has to blow. He's not making a lot when even the fans that come and talk to him don't buy anything. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's that's a, that's a very bad uh, business. Uh, arrangements he may have there well i've never never been to a comic con um joe who's the kind of biggest you know but you know maybe it's two different questions i'd say the biggest star you've met and maybe the best experience you've had or you know most in, um enjoyable encounter i i've seen all of the cast of the next generation uh oh, william shatner i saw him uh i'm trying to think that's pretty cool Oh, you know, Lou Ferrigno, you know, the the guy who plays Darth Vader, uh, David Prowse. David Prowse, yeah. Uh, As yeah, we call him, the Green Cross Code, man. Yeah. <laughs> I remember you mentioning that, and I, I watched, I, maybe you sent me a video on that. Yeah, yeah. That, that was kind of fascinating. And he <laughs> helped uh, Christopher Reeve get in shape for Superman the movie, too, because um, he was a weightlifter, a bodybuilder back then. But yeah, no, it's it's fun because you see a lot of people cosplaying, like as comic book heroes or or movie heroes and stuff like that. It's if you're a nerd, you're in, in paradise. But it's been taken over by people that, like, at some point it was hip to go to like these comic cons and like all of these like hot girls decide it's like, well, you know, I want to be the center of attention and make a costume where I look just like the Scarlet Witch or Mary Jane or you know or Supergirl, and it, it just kind of changed where it's it, it, a business now whereby the people that are cosplaying charge you charge you to have photographs with them oh yeah they, they all well that's the whole thing is like when i used to go to these comic cons like you could see like the whole cast of the next generation just sitting there and there'd be a line you know for you to go and pay your 35 dollars or 100 dollars to get a picture with them uh and now they have it blocked off where you have to go into a, a room to meet them. So you can't even see them if you want to. Yeah. Because they don't want you taking pictures. They, you know, 
They want you paying. If you really want to see this person, you can't say and look across the room and say, oh, there's Patrick Stewart. It's like, wow, that's pretty cool. Mm. It's like you're never going to get that experience unless you pay, you fork out over money. So, yeah, I wouldn't have seen Jill Gerard reading a, a paperback. Right. I probably still would have because he would have been like discount celebrity right here, buddy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the I, I went to a Comic-Con um, and my mate paid 270 quid uh to get a photograph with Kiefer Sutherland. Oh wow. And I was like, and the the worst thing is it was peeing down with rain. Um the the, the, the tents were overloading because it's that much water. So everyone was trying to protect it. I did get some pretty cool prints, but we had to wait around for three hours and there wasn't anything else to do. So we were just basically pitched up in a wet tent. And to add to that, there was no signal for the mobile. So that was good. So by the time he has to queue in line, there's no uh, there's no shelter. So he's got a picture of himself with Keeper Sutherland where he looks like a drowned rat, and Keeper Sutherland's <laughs> like, "Hey," and I'm like, "That's really funny." Minute, is that it? Is is that all you get for two hundred seventy quid? That's, that's a phenomenal amount. Two hundred seventy five quid for that photo, and there's a line of people. I don't know if you meant it took three hours to, to go through that queue, but you know, he must be all right. He's a Hollywood actor, used to getting paid millions of dollars for a movie or a TV franchise. But um, yeah. that's still quite a lot of money for a day, isn't it? Really? Yeah. And thankfully, well, especially... well, thankfully, one of the people that knew Matt, the guy that I was with, saw us, saw him looking like a drowned rat, and went, "Oh, I'll, I'll take you home if you want. It's fine." I, I'm, he says, "Just give me a minute. I've got to go and meet Sam Neil." And he was oh, dressed really? up like Doctor Grant from Jurassic. He was dressed up like. <laughs> Um, Jurassic Park, um, and he went. And he went in, and we sat in this car, and it was dry, and it was warm, and it was great. And then he came back, like quarter of an hour later, and went, "Oh God, he's still, he's still a great guy." And it turns out that the guy that he knows that down the pub ferries these people around all the time, so like he knows them in the sense of he didn't pay to go and see him. He just went, "Hi Sam, hey, how's it going?" You know, and all this sort of thing. And that must be a bit odd because you dressed as the character, but you also know him, and that's a bit weird. It's like me dressing as you, Joe. I mean, you know, that'd be that'd be very strange. Um, you know what was interesting too is like because you saw all of them, they had like like a, almost like the Last Supper table, you know, yeah, yeah, like where they had the next generation all sitting there, and each like if you wanted to get a like a an autograph from uh, Wharf or something like that, and you get on the line. To go there so that might be 10 people on the line but for patrick stewart they were like 100 150 people and it was right. just like and you would see for some reason data had nobody you know oh. and denise crosby had like maybe 20 and like all of them had different it's kind of embarrassing like for some people are just sitting there waiting for someone to come up to them you know and then meanwhile you look at patrick stewart's line and there's like 100 people there and i just remember like you know, Data's face, Brent Spiner. He just looks so pissed. I don't know why you, nobody wanted to see him because I thought he was a popular character. Yeah, but, uh, I would have thought so. And, and Q was there too. They had, they had everybody there. It was like crazy. And like Denise Crosby, she was only in, I think, seven episodes. And uh, But this was like, took place much later in life. So she she was signing autographs too. So it was yeah. kind of cool. Oh, she's she, very, she was a very popular character, despite the fact that she was killed off. She was another Molly Ringwall, you know, <laughs> because uh, she was very popular. And then she's like, I'm going to go have a movie career. Didn't work out for her. Yeah, I think she was in Pet Cemetery uh, yep. and a film called Miracle Mile with Anthony Edwards, Goose out of Top Gun. Yeah. Which I really, I think it's a really good film. I know oh, I'm also said to go and watch that. Patrick Stewart offered this Patrick Stewart experience where you could sit down and talk to him for 10 minutes in a room. And I think it was like two or $300. You know? <laughs> there was a line for that too. I mean, could you, you could record ask him it. Any... Could you record it? I don't know. I probably, I think back then you probably could have recorded it. Quite cheap. Yeah. Well, back then, you know. Yeah, it was okay. Well, maybe... accounting for inflation, that's like $2 billion or something. Like that. Uh, yeah, it was a, a, probably about 12 years ago. Right. Yes, it's gone up significantly. Yes. Oh, okay, cool. 
I, I did like Buck Rogers getting back to the uh, getting back to the original thing. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> we we um, I think the British seem to latch on to um, Twicky. Is it Twicky? Bitty, bitty. The road, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so all of the shows, the comedy shows of the time, would used to parody it, parody it, and obviously you get Mel Gibson Spaceballs, which obviously has the Twicky in there as well. As I remember, Mel, Mel Blank. Is it? The, oh, was it? Said, I no, you it was said Mel, you, no, you said Mel Gibson Spaceballs. It says Mel oh. Blank. Yeah, I, th- I thought there was no, a link. Mel Brooks existed. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, it's not Mel Blue. No, and I got yeah. it wrong too. It's yeah. Mel Brooks. Mel Blank. I was like, he's a Mel, Blank play, Mel Blank was the voice of Tweaky, though. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, Joe Rivers was the voice of the Tweaky clone in Spaceballs. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, right. Enough space. Enough more chimpanzees in space again. Um, Dom, over to you. Yeah, well, look, uh, you know, I, I'm fascinated by these more obscure um, parts of the era that we're looking at here. But again, I'm going to kind of take a step back. And so, some listeners will have heard me talk about this or touch on this in the, in the past. And uh, it's may cause Charlie really to roll his eyes. But the, the date that I want to highlight from this um, period is April 19th, 1987, which is when The Simpsons uh, premiered as a short on the Tracy Ullman show. Yeah. So, I wouldn't roll my eyes. Well, I don't know. You, 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 we did you talk know about husband. it on the, on the one before last. Yeah, yeah, but I um I just wanted to I guess you know kind of acknowledge you because it, it, it's it's difficult to compare um episodes across genres. You know, is um The Simpsons better than The Wire or Game of Thrones? Well, you know th- these are tough comparisons. Um, but yeah. certainly in the um comedy world of comedy or you know, humorous writing, particularly animation, for me it's the the best program the most um important program to me i think growing up as a teenager and as even into my kind of early early 20s uh mm. it's become a kind of a, a shadow of its former self sustained purely to make profits i'm not talking about kind of more recent seasons but i think that kind of golden era between about season three and where do you, where'd you draw the line 11 maybe um just almost stone cold classic after stone cold classic yeah, and yeah as you probably recall uh, Charles, for our, our time in Nottingham together, the, the joy of me visiting home and coming back down with a video where I'd have the latest episodes. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Down and, and watch, watch those. Definitely a formative um, period of my of my uh, life. And, and I think for me, one of the, the apart from all the obvious pleasures that, that exist with it, so some of the, the family themselves and that kind of second tier characters is what I'd call the sort of third tier characters that you, that you often forget and kind of are, are overlooked. So the likes of... Uh, Superintendent Chalmers, Lionel Hutz, Nick Riviera, Hans <laughs> Molman. These, um, you know, in, in, in any other show, who would be, uh, you know, the, the whole thing would be centered and based around them, um, which would be a, a massive amount of joy. And as I was kind of thinking about this for the for the pod today and doing a bit of research, <laughs> it's the character Gil, Gil Gunderson, that they have in there yeah. as well, which is obviously very, I think, unapologetically based on. The character in um, Glen Gary, Glen Ross, um, <laughs> for, for those who've seen it. I thought to myself, that would be an absolutely wonderful show to do for a future pod here. But of course, on checking the date, it's 92. I thought I might have just oh. squeezed in with the late 80s, but very sadly. So as and when, if and when, we ever do go into the uh, into the late 70s or early 90s, that's going to definitely be one of my... Yeah, uh, we'll can- definitely, we'll put that, we'll put on the list when we check, when, if we change. Yeah. At some point, um, we'll run out. We'll, we'll have to get to another decade. I, I don't know about running out, but maybe future seasons. You know, if we're looking thematically for sequels or you know whatever, whatever kind of take on the nineteen eighties um, genre that we can find. You know, if one of them is kind of the bookends, then then I definitely think that's a strong contender for that uh, for that area. So yeah, so some apologies, and I won't do it for any future ones. But for me, it was <laughs> a bit of a loving and recognition of the Simpsons, and and for anyone who's kind of seen the shorts. Um, just the inexplicable way that that actually then transformed into the kind of uh, cultural and um, commercial uh, juggernaut that it that it became. Because to my eyes, at least, very unpromising and pretty indecipherable um, comic clips in the Tracy Ullman show. And then maybe it was huge in America. I don't know, and that's what launched it to prominence. But um, yeah, from from such small from such such small shoots, such a you know a beautiful thing bloomed. Yeah. Absolutely. Who was the stuntman in The Simpsons? In the, I remember, all I remember you do, doing for a time at Capital One is my eyes. 
the gargoyles uh, do that, nothing. That was radioactive man, yeah. The, the character that was very McBain, mostly based on Arnold Schwarzenegger, the Austrian uh, the <laughs> character. But, yeah, I, I was thinking about one of my favourite episodes, and that um, radioactive man was, was definitely up there. And uh, yeah, the scene when the the sulfuric acid is pouring down that's the right, corner. Right. The director turns and says, now this is real acid, people, so put on your goggles. And uh, <laughs> real acid. <laughs> yeah, the goggles, they do nothing. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful throwaway line. It's a brilliant episode, which, much as I love it and enjoy it, probably you know, is my all-time top ten, uh, but it's still, yeah, it makes me laugh more than any anything else I can think of. No, I was laughing while you were talking because I was just thinking I was I was watching on YouTube the best of groundskeeper Willie, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> there's a part where he goes, "I didn't cry when me, they hung me mother for stealing a pig, but I cry now." <laughs> yeah, he, he, he's he's a, he's a brilliant uh, a brilliant character. Um, and um, my, my daughter now is 11 and she in fact yeah she's she's guested on this pod in, in in the past rose and she watches it and she loves it as well so i get to watch them through through her eyes as well um brilliant homer a uh, king size homer where he purposefully gains weight to yeah. uh, to get onto workplace disability scheme absolute <laughs> absolute classic where is um, where is <laughs> yeah poncho and Moo Moo. um the James Bond spoof, you two obviously you can love that. That'll be my main contribution to any James Bond deep dive that we do in future seasons. Will be uh, you only move twice when uh, when he when he goes and goes lives in the centre of a the volcano. Um, but we've we've tried to incorporate it into my <laughs> family. We, we still have some of the lines that we use on a not on a daily basis necessarily, but at least once a week. Will be my moral to the children of um, you tried your best and you failed miserably. The lesson is never try. I think that's good, good parenting <laughs> advice and. Uh, what about one that my daughter's picked up on, which is I didn't think it was physically possible, but this both sucks and blows, which is a uh, <laughs> quite an Americanism as well for a, for a young English girl to be using. Uh, one of my favorites is when Homer gets a gun. <laughs> what the makeup yeah. gun? Where he's uh, he, he, where he, you, you point it? Right oh no, not that one. No, and, uh, no, they end up going to a, a soccer match, like they're advertising a soccer match on TV, and they make it seem like really exciting. And the kids are like, can we go, Dad? Can we go, Dad? And he goes, why can't we? So they, the whole family goes there, and they're bored out of their minds, you know, because they're just kicking the ball back and forth. Nobody's scoring. And then uh, something happens, and there's a big brawl, you know, in the stands. And then, like, the the whole town is under martial law. <laughs> and so Marge is scared that, she, you know, she needs something to protect their family and they look at an alarm and it's too expensive. And then Homer brings home a gun and he goes, close your eyes, Marge. <laughs> and she opens it up and like the barrel is right under her nose. <laughs> and he's like, don't worry, it's not loaded. And he starts shooting it, you know, like the, the trigger starts going back and forth. That's a great episode. I mean, it cracks me up because like he had to, uh, you know, in, in the United States, you have to, there's a waiting period before you can get a gun. And he's like, he goes, uh, I'll take this gun now. And he goes, well, buddy, you're going to have to wait at least uh, three days before we do uh, research on you. And he's like, if I had my gun now, I'd kill you. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's a, it's a, it is a brilliant episode because the, the game is um, Mexico, Portugal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd kill myself if Portugal doesn't win. Um, and <laughs> we're just passing it around, around midfield, as you say, and then we, they cut to the Spanish commentators who are, who are uh, going 100 <laughs> miles an hour as if it's the greatest game that they've, uh, they've seen. That, that's that's wonderful. But when you talk about Home With a Gun, I thought you were talking about the casino episode when uh, Marge develops a gambling addiction and leaves mm. the house uh, to Home, which then probably falls into disarray when she eventually returns home days later. She opens the door and there's Homer and the children uh, cowering <laughs> behind a table and he brings a shotgun out <laughs> because he thinks that the boogeyman or boogeyman may be in the vicinity. <laughs> no, there's so many good. And I like the one with John Waters, you know, when uh, Homer oh, befriends yeah. him Homer's and he doesn't know yeah. he's gay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's so many good ones. Um, I have a Simpsons on, on my next thing. I've got a, 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 a she warned the Simpsons reference into there. So, that seems like a really good segue. Um, I wanted to talk about the cultural event, uh, which was uh, April the 21st, 1980. Who shot JR? Hmm. Because 
that seems to be bigger than I remembered. I remember it being big, but when you look at, I went and watched a YouTube video about it. That thing was everywhere. It was. People, it was huge over here. People were talking about it. Larry Hagman was offered a hundred when he was in the UK. He was offered a hundred thousand pounds if he if he said on live TV who who shot him. And he said, "I don't know. We've shot like ten different endings, so I don't know who shot me." And you're like, but looking at the figures, eighty three million people watched. So it's it's the second highest uh, behind Mash. It's the second highest episode watch. I mean, I know it's all changed now, and there'll be other ones that, that you know, uh, that, that might have moved in and out. But yeah, Dallas was a big Dallas was a big deal. I mean, Dom, you won't remember. Yeah, you, know, you weren't born um, at that time. So. I remember, I remember my parent. My mum was quite a. Um, she, she had quite arty taste. She was quite political. She had lots of these interests, but she had a real soft spot for American soap operas. I think she she didn't watch them slavishly, but she you know she. No matter what airs and graces she put on, I think um, Dallas was something that she Dallas she and Dynasty, yeah, and the Colbys. So, but uh, yeah, no, I, my 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 association with them, as you say, is after the fact and the kind of I don't know, sort of like strange legacy they've left. So I'd be interested in Joe's take on how they're perceived these days. But you're right, obviously, you know, very richly mined with who shot Mr. Burns uh, over a double yeah, episode, yeah, and Simpsons subsequently. And, one of my main bits of knowledge about Dallas, which is highly fragmentary knowledge, is one season of it was an in, entirely a dream, wasn't it? The first, yes, that's right. The guy in the shower, and uh, yeah, maybe, maybe it had already jumped the shark by that point, and um, it was not on its peak. But yeah, I've, I've never truly understood the legacy, or, or, or yeah, Bobby, point. Bobby was it was all a dream. So Bobby uh, stepped out of the shower, and he was supposed to. Have, if I remember, he was supposed to have died. And, and, it, came, and it wiped and it wiped the um wiped out the, the, the previous season, yeah. <laughs> but it didn't, didn't happen. But then right, you got all the like, corner. Yeah. Yeah, I think one it, it was either Dallas or Dynasty where sorry, someone was taken sorry, by Dynasty. A UFO. Dynasty. Uh, Dynasty. Dynasty. I say Dynasty. Dynasty. <laughs> yeah, Dynasty. Okay. Yeah, uh, well. I think someone was taken by a UFO. Uh I, Yes. Yeah, I seem to remember that. It it was all good, like a bit samey after a while. I did like the Colbys, the spin-off, because that's Stephanie Beecham in. And even even young Charles thought Stephanie Beecham, she's quite nice. <laughs> um and then the older women things spawned from somewhere. So yes, I would probably blame that. But I, I mean I, as a kid I, I wasn't into Dallas because I thought it was boring, you know, it was on yeah, Friday that's a good nights. character though, isn't he? Well, you know, it's funny because like I never got over the fact because he was in I Dream of Genie. You know, he played Genie's master, and I couldn't get over the fact that he was Jr. because he was always Major Nelson to me. Oh, okay. Well, oh. I think if you put his face up there and went, uh, I think you get pointless answers. Most over people here. would. For I Dream of Genie, yeah. Not me. Mm, okay. And he was in Superman the movie too. Oh, he was as well, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. But yeah, I just, w water cooler moments and things like that anymore. I mean, you referenced uh, Who Shot Mr. Burns. Twin Peaks did the same thing at the end of the, end of the season. Agent Cooper was shot. And it was like, well, who shot him? But if you take the Dallas thing, how, how to manipulate an audience is genius. You didn't find out who shot JR until the fourth episode of the fourth season. So you had all this filler, and everybody, the, the advertisers must have loved it because yeah, you didn't have any internet, no leaks, you know. Yeah. yeah. And over here, um, so we had a DJ called Terry Wogan, and he loved he loved to talk about Dallas on his radio show. He had the he had the morning show, um, and he used to call, um, oh, what was her name, the short blonde girl that was in Dallas, uh, Charlene Tilton. That's I knew. it. He used to call her the poison dwarf. Oh, I said the D word. But yeah, I'm oh, no. using it as a as a reference. But yeah, he used to call her that. And that's okay. And people thought that was hilarious. And my dad thought, I just kept going, oh, you po poison dwarf. I'm like, uh, okay. <laughs> not not all uh, British humor works works everywhere. Um so who who else? We're nearly to a close. 
Wait, but where where should we go next? I don't Joe? know who's next. Is, is it me? Uh, yeah, I think so. Oh, so I don't know if you, if you guys have seen this movie. I remember seeing it on HBO, and I have fond memories of it. It was on April 17, 1981, Caveman came out to theaters. Did you guys ever see that movie? No. That is something that needs to go into your movie library, Charlie. Okay. It uh, stars Ringo Starr, Dennis Quaid, Shelley Long, and Barbara Bach. And that's the movie that Ringo Starr met Barbara Bach, fell in love, and they got married. Wow. And Oh, it's... okay. I, I often wondered how the two, the two of them met, but okay. And it's all about, like, you know, it takes place during caveman time, and there's no spoken words whatsoever. It's uh, what, wait, no English. wait, wait. It's set in caveman time, so you've got. Barbara Back and Ringo Starr dressed up as cavemen. Yeah, it's that doesn't. That's it, not selling it, Joe. What's that? That's not selling it. Well, Ringo Starr is basically he's an outcast because he's small, he's skinny, can't and play then the drums that well. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't play the drums in this. You know, <laughs> uh, it's very funny. It, it's very, very, very good. Oh, it's sorry, it's a comedy. It's a comedy. Yeah. I, I think you would love it. You know, again, there was no spoken word in it whatsoever, but you know, there's a, a leader of this group of cavemen and, uh, and so his mate is Barbara Bach and Ringo's character wants to get with Barbara Bach. But, uh, the guy is like the size of the Hulk, like Lou Ferrigno. So there's no way he's getting with her. And so he's just like, uh, an, uh, you know, an outcast, uh, F up. Uh, nobody in the tribe likes him. So eventually he's got to run away and uh, he finds his own people of, of outcasts and right. they start to, you know, like 2001, like mistakes happen where they start to learn tools right. or, or they learn to make fire. It's, it's real. It's a funny movie. It's, it's really good. I, I loved it. And uh, I think you would love it too. You're telling me he doesn't take the opportunity to parody 2001 A Space Odyssey by by taking two bones and start start drumming on there. And if I, oh, look, I see what you did there. I think I might actually at some point. Oh, okay. Oh, dear. But like I, I see, and like the, the creatures that they have that are dinosaurs are over exaggerated and like they have cross eyes and, you know, it's it's claymation. It, it's pretty it's pretty funny. You know, the, the dinosaurs are, are claymation. The minute that we finish that this podcast, I will be googling the trailer. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I'm telling you, just All add right. that to add that know, to yes, to my Charlie's library, and you'll enjoy it. Okay. All right. I just, I just think if if Sting is a red flag to a movie, then what's really going to start <laughs> is like uh, barbed wire and machine gun turrets. Do, do, do not enter. Here. You grew up with Thomas the Tank Engine, so you know you have got to have some sort of respect for him. Kind of sucks. We didn't. Right? We had Alec Baldwin doing the voice of like the the conductor over here. We didn't I've have got, Ringo Starr. I've got, I've got nothing but respect for Ringo Starr. What a life that man has led. But yeah, when he yeah. mentions into the world of film, you know, that, that's probably where I uh, let go of his hand and wish him well. And uh, yeah, see what <laughs> we Wow. Well, it's over to you, Tom. For maybe they, maybe the last. No, no, no. Don't end on, don't end on me. I've not got. I've not got a climax to bring us to. I'm afraid. I've. I'm. I'm spent after my uh, my two earlier contributions. So uh, oh. back to yourself. Well, I did. We'll get, I'd probably then on a final note, if that's okay, gents. Uh, 1989, Wayne's World debuted. Debuted on. Deb, debuted. Debuted on uh, Saturday Night Live. Um. Culturally, that's one of those things where we talk about the who shot JR and things like that. That's a bridge. Everyone knew Wayne's World. You know, you I remember them them parodying the Justify My Love video on Saturday Night Live with Madonna. Mm -hmm. That was that was very good. Um, I think the films are great. However, um, I know you have uh, a lot of success, um, Don, with your uh, daughters when you're watching things that made you laugh and things that you think are funny, and then you put them in, and then. Sometimes you're disappointed when they don't find it as funny as yeah. you do. Wayne's World, she doesn't. Yeah, no. She's going. Doesn't she? Doesn't get it. My, my eldest um, and I don't have the same sense of humour, so I have trouble introducing her to comedies. My youngest does, but I think Wayne's right. World 
and Austin Powers are still a little too old for her, so I won't be introducing those to her just yet. But yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, I loved Wayne's World. Now, I would you know, def- definitely watch it again if it was on this evening, but um, how well it translates to a younger generation, I'm not, not sure, because perhaps they don't really know what it's parodying as, as well as, as, as we would. Um, you know, yeah, but I think point about point. things that I say to with Amanda, um, one of them being the mole, mole from uh, Austin Powers Gold member. And Amy just thinks that's incredible. I had to think, thought that's incredibly funny. But we watched all three uh, films when we were on holiday a couple of weeks ago. Um, and she sort of liked it. I don't think she'd run back from it. But as soon as the mole scene happened, that was it. She was in fits of laughter. And she's going, that's where it comes from. And so, yeah, but you can't go around doing that. <laughs> you can't when you, when you see someone. You know, you can't be John Candy and Uncle Buck, you know. Here's a here's a quarter. Try and find a rat to gnaw that thing off your face. Mm. <laughs> but, but I don't know. Perhaps if you um are brought up on sort of sixties Bond films and then you watch the, the satire and the parody of Austin Powers, yeah. you perhaps appreciate it. You know, don't get me wrong. Some of it's just slapstick humour that <clears throat> translates anywhere. But you know, perhaps if you understand the, the source material a bit more, it's you know you appreciate it. Yeah. In a different way, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think it's one that'll live on uh, too long. Will Ferrell is not in that. Is not in either of their first two films for long, but what he does contribute is amazing. He's the Arab guy, isn't he? The, the, um, yeah, in the face. Yeah. A long time to die in the pit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you shot me. I, I can't believe you shot me. <laughs> I, I was watching him the other day in old school. He is brilliant in that. Yeah, I was listening to a podcast. Uh, what was? Oh no, I was listening it's, to your podcast, Joe. Yeah, I, 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 I did mention it. it. Yeah. yeah. You, ever, yeah. you saw that, right? Old school. Yes. Yeah. 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 He's great. Yeah. I think I need to go and add that to the library. My library that would be is nice. Like, library <laughs> plenty. Right. Um, so, so I'm going to go and look up Caveman trailer. I was um, going to say, too, with Mike Myers, though. I mean, it, it's funny because I didn't think it was going to take off as as great as it did, you know, uh, in Wayne's World. and But it did. It was huge. Yeah. And. But it just goes to show he he burned his bridges so badly in Hollywood that they don't hire him for anything. They could have easily, even now, make a Wayne's World 3 and make yeah. a ton of money. They could make a Austin Powers 4, make a ton of money. And they could have made one after Austin Powers 3, but they were done with him. Apparently, he is the one of the biggest jerks in Hollywood, right. and no one gets along with him. I mean, I heard they were going to make a Dr. Evil movie. Um but I don't know if that's going to happen. Like they, there's just Hollywood is so powerful. If they don't like you, and even if you, they know you can make a ton of money, they're not going to do it. But you know, we suffered with that was uh, Dana Carvey. You know, yeah, he was yeah. kind of like guilt by association, and he didn't make anywhere near as much money as uh, you know Mike Myers. Mm-hmm. And apparently, he came up with the character of Doctor Evil. And he really? never got any credit for it. Yeah. Because hmm. that was shame. a uh, that was an impersonation of Lauren Michaels that he used to do from you know the <laughs> producer of Saturday Night Live. Yeah. Wow. We will always have uh So I Married an Axe Murderer. I mean Oh yeah, that's, that's I love just that great. One. That's just yeah. so good. Um and the thing is, he, he was when did he last crop up? He was in um he was Glorious the record, record boss. Yeah, he was the record boss in Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So he's he's there on yeah, he's in little bits here, little bits there. But you're right. If you wanted oh, to make I, it a load of money, just have my money, make Austin Powers for. I, I just think he's right for you know, we mentioned Jim Carrey earlier on this pod, who obviously had a different type of career that made some more interesting films straight roles playing quite dark space and I've seen his per- private life I gather you know had some pretty difficult situations and I just think Michael Myers is um you know just nailed on to do something like that at some point you know to re-emerge in, in more of a kind of a sinister darker space you know more more proper acting rather than comedy acting I, I, I'd i be really interested to see if he if he pursued that or perhaps he's just got his hundreds of millions of dollars and goes and lives on a yacht off the coast of Saint Tropez or something and we don't see him again but yeah he's definitely burnt his bridges and that but I, I think he's smart enough you know there's enough talent and creativity in some of the characters that he's done for me to be really interested in whether or not he has a, a second or a third act perhaps 
Mm. Yeah, could be. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I'm going to go and watch Sarah Marion Axe Murder. Um, <laughs> again. Uh, cool. Right. Well, this is it. There's no more this week in the 80s. Um, I've enjoyed this a lot of bits when you've been able to join in in and out. But yeah, we'll be kicking off the new season in, in two weeks' time. Uh, I don't know with what we've got to do the draw, haven't we, to find out his what what order we're going to go in. Are we, are we going to share with the listeners what the theme of it is? Uh, we are, but we're not going to share what films they are. By the way, I was still waiting for some. Dom, you need to pick four films. No, no, I, I do I'm, too. I'm so- I've sent them to you. Did you send? Oh, okay, sorry. It's Joe, me. It's, it's you, right? Okay. Yeah. I knew it was one of you. Okay. Uh, yeah. The theme is Lucky Dip. Each of us picks four films, uh, and we're going to cover them, and we're just going to go in rotation on them. But we'll do the uh, the FA Cup FA Cup style draw for the uh, what order that is, and we'll actually get a bit more organised for season seven. We actually we we'll actually have a calendar when we're going to, rather than any chance you can do three o'clock on a on a Sunday. Um, so, yeah, we'll, we'll work all of that out. I want listeners. Amanda back. I miss, I miss Amanda. She needs to, we need to maybe start with one of hers to guarantee her appearance. Yeah, she's um, she's the secret source of this pod, I think. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go and tell her now. I think she's back from Birmingham. So, yes, she, she might. Uh, yes, I will pass on the compliment. So, Joe, do you want to tell everyone where they can find your podcast? Wonderful podcast that it is. Oh, thanks. Yeah, you can find me. It's uh, called WDWNT Nerd Alert. And uh, we're on Spotify, iTunes, and uh, a bunch of other places where they, they have podcasts. And yeah, we just do a bunch of nerdy stuff. And we have a good time. And it's it's a lot of fun. We, well, we have fun. It is. It's great <laughs> fun. Um, even though Jack's review of uh, Shazam, I mean, nine out of t- what did he give it? Eight out of ten? Yeah, I, I thought he gave it a nine out of ten. Yeah, Jack, I think Jack was on crack. That's all I so can say. I watched, I I watched twenty minutes of Shazam, turned it off, and just went. I've got, I've got, I need the two hours of my life back. Um, that I'm gonna get back. So, no, I, I got messages from listeners, and they're like, "I'm so glad you didn't like Shazam because I I I felt there was something wrong with me since Jack liked it so much," and I'm like. No. Nah, yeah, don't Jack. take Jack's <laughs> don't take Jack. Well, I hope Jack doesn't listen to this podcast, but yeah, you're very no. wrong on that one. And you're so right on Joker. But anyway, on that uh on that bombshell, we'll leave it there. We will see you for season seven. Uh but until then, take care and see you later. Bye bye. See ya.